Hi, I'm Brother Lawrence Jordan, pastor of the New Bethel Baptist Church located at 2729 Oak Grove Road in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And today our Sunday school lesson for July the 2nd, 2017 is That's Not Fair. It is the fifth lesson of this quarter. And our unifying topic is Moses and the burning bush. Our scriptures are taken today from Exodus, the third chapter, verses 1 through 12. Our background scriptures are the entire third chapter of Exodus. And we come this week to one of the great prophets. And if we looked at him, he would look as if he is associated with the judges that we have just come, come away from. Because if you know the story of this man, Moses, that we're going to be dealing with today, this, this man, Moses, the international topic is just Moses. So this man, Moses, with, that, that we're dealing with, he would judge the people of Israel while they are there in the desert. And it would be that father-in-law, Jethro, that would come in and tell him that he needs to judge the bigger things and delegate the smaller things to other people in the nation to let them help him handle some of this because his workload was wearing him down. But now we're still in this area of God's urgent Call God is doing an urgent call as he calls this man Moses this week on the scene. Moses would be a prophet. We, we know him to be, some say, the greatest man of the Old Testament, the, the greatest of the prophets of the Old Te Testament. And Moses this week will also deal with Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Amos. We'll deal with all of those prophets in, 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 the, in the coming weeks. But here, we're still dealing with this with God's urgent call and now dealing with the prophets. We just come out of the judges and the urgent, dealing with that again, saying urgent means that it's, it's something that is compelling or requiring immediate attention or some type of action. To, to say compelling means it, a powerful or irresistible influence that drives one to act in a certain way. We, we saw him as he was there in Egypt in Pharaoh's house and seeing his people under the oppression, seeing his people under the hand of the taskmasters when he saw one of the Hebrew men being mistreated one day and he killed the Egyptian. And for 40 years, he had lived there in the Pharaoh's court, his, being born an Israelite, a Hebrew. He had, by his mother, put in a, uh, in a basket and sent down the Nile and retrieved by the, the princess, the, the Pharaoh's daughter, and raised in the Pharaoh's court. This young man had, had learned all the things about the Egyptian way. Acts tells us, Acts 7 and 22 says that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in word and deed. That would seem kind of strange to us because later on he'd say that, Lord, I don't speak too well. But he was, he was very powerful in, in word and deed. But this man felt uh, an urge to respond, an uh, urge to respond, but it took 40 years for him to be able to really respond to this call. He was raised in the Pharaoh's court. After he killed the man and he discovered that he had been discovered, he, he, was, he left Egypt, fleeing for his life, and now in this place, working for his father-in-law, Jethro, and we come to this area right here. This man, the reason that his mother had sent him down the Nile was because at that time, he being a male Hebrew would have been killed. 
all the male he that would be part of the oppression. That would be part of the sorrow that they would be going through because Pharaoh had said, "Kill all the males. Don't 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 let them live." The Israelite nation, the Hebrew nation, was was growing powerful and great. Remember, they came into Egypt on a good note when Joseph, the son of Jacob, had brought in his family. But now they were there. This was something that God had already told them that that they were going to be in this land for this. For, for a period of time, God had already let them know there in Genesis 15, 13, when God talked to Abram, he said, and he said unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them for 400 years. Now, 400 years later, these people came in on this sweet note, but now they have been brought under the taskmasters and oppressed, and, and the, the, the people there were feeling like they were going to take over at, at, at some point because their numbers began to grow at a rapid rate. God caused that to happen, and they decided that this is the way we'll stop it. We'll kill the males, and then we have the urgent call. Today, our lesson starts in as this man is now 80 years old, two times 40. He was 40 years old when he left Egypt. Now he's, in, he's been in the wilderness, in the desert for, for 40 years. So he is an 80-year-old man. And that was seemingly young at that time. So here it is. It said, now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb, or it could be said there, even to Sinai. Here in the Sinai Peninsula, if you have looked at the map and see the way that the, the territory is, is arranged, here the, Moses, he kept, his father-in-law's flock. Now, you have to stop there at the word kept for just a second. Anytime you see this, when someone is keeping a flock, because if you are li really listening to what's going on there, it would be the kind of the role of a pastor. He, he is definitely tending the flock. If you looked up the word, but the Hebrew word for it, kept in that place, but it will also tell you that this person would be also a shepherd or even a pastor. And, and we'll find that this was good training and for for this man at this time we would we would like to say young man but he's working for his father-in-law and he's 80 years old now and he's out here and it, it, it working for his father-in-law tending the flock or pastoring them learning how to to treat people while he's treating animals so he says he his father-in-law had a special term said there in front of him. He was the priest or he was the spiritual leader of the people there in Midians. And we know as we went through some of the previous lessons that the Midianite people were, were some that were what were kind of nomadic. But here we see this man here that he, uh, he was able later able to travel along with the Israelite nation for a period of time before he, he left them. But here the, the people of Midian, he, he led, Moses led this flock to the backside of the desert. Now, when we look at the backside here of, of the desert or in this, this Sinai Peninsula at this time, the eastern side would have been a special side for the, for the Hebrew nation, the Israelite nation, for Moses, for even Moses. But Moses being the writer of this, this would be the western side. That would be called the backside. The east side would be called the front side because the east was very special to the Hebrew people, the Israelite nation. So he led him to the backside of the desert, and he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Now, just to say one more thing about this verse before we leave it is, is that Jephro's name meant his excellency. This was a special man. He, was, he would be the man that would, would coach his, his son-in-law later on. But this man, filling the role of 
a tender of the flock or a shepherd at this time. Verse two says, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, unto Moses, appeared unto Moses in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. Now this man is looking at at this, this scene right here. He is at this time becoming a prophet of God. The next things will classify him as a prophet. If you looked up the in the biblical dictionaries, the, the, the word for prophet, you'll see that they they are people that communicated directly with God with and got a message from God to give directly to the people of Israel, to God's people. It, it, they were to, to God's chosen people. He says that the, the angel appeared to him in this flame of fire. At one time, this may not have even stopped this man. At, at one time, when he was in the hustle and bustle of, the, uh, of Egypt, when he was the popular man there in Egypt, but serving in the, in, in the Pharaoh's court or, court or being a big guy in, the, in that region at that time, but now he had been humbled by years of being in the desert. See, it's something about being in the desert. It's something about those times that every time it seems that the Lord was really getting ready to deal with someone or really getting someone to where they could truly be used. This man was a man that we will see and we can see really needed to be broken because he was kind of a man that would just do his own thing when he, as he killed the Egyptian there. But we saw that that God took certain people through the desert. Elijah was there in the desert. He was a man of the desert. He, John the Baptist, he was a man of the desert down, down near the Dead Sea in the southern region of Israel. This, this man, he grew up down there, John the Baptist. And then there was the Apostle Paul after his conversion, spent three years in the desert of Arabia. That, and John, the revelator, the, on the Isle of Patmos, talking to the Lord, getting instructions, told to write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter while he was in that desert experience. So it, these, these things happen to people here in the desert. Now this man is in the desert. Now he is seeing this flame of fire. Initially, to him and just about anybody that worked in the desert all the time, it may not have caught their attention that a tree was on fire or a bush was on fire. But what made this bush different was the fact of the last part of that verse said that the bush was not consumed. It was a natural thing. If something was burning, then it was being consumed and it would eventually burn to the ground. But this did not burn to the ground. It was it, it was able to stay there, and, and this is this is all happening while he while he is here in the desert. You and I may have had desert experience. I know I have, where 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 the Lord is 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 dealing with us in a special way, where feelings and emotions don't mean a lot at that point. Only thing really means something is that the Word of God is still working in our lives, and He's still talking to us and still using us in a special way. And we're walking by faith and not by sight because there's nothing that we see but desert experiences in the desert itself. Even though we're in the midst of many people, we're in a desert-like condition or experience. But the bush itself, it was not consumed. And Moses said, verse three, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burnt. That was the thing that made him turn, was the bush was not burnt. His previous life, he may not have noticed this, but but now that, now that he's in the desert, now that there's nothing else to focus his eyes on, nothing else to take his attention off of, off, take his attention away from his surrounding, what's going on actually around. See, sometimes we're in the midst of too much 
happening. Too much going on to hear what the Lord is trying to say to us. And this man, he had been taken out of the city life. And now he has been in the desert for another 40 years being broken down to a place where God could actually communicate with him. What would it take for God to be able to communicate with you and I? Verse four says, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Now the Lord called Moses when he, when he saw that he turned Aside. Now, God knew that this would strike his attention. God did. God wasn't confused about whether this would turn him. God had taken 40 years to raise this man to go in to Egypt and bring his people out by a great hand. He knew that this would get this man's attention. He knew that now this man has been broken. The city, the, the fast life doesn't mean anything to him anymore. He is that broken spirit, that broken and contrite heart. Now God can and communicate with him. And he, God called him out of the bush. He called him twice. And because he called him twice in that type of way, called his name twice, Moses, Moses, he said, here am I. It's me. He didn't, he didn't, he wasn't that same fellow that, that, that would have said something different just of this 40 years earlier. He says here now, he might have said, I'm your man then. But here it says, verse five, and he said, draw not now hither. This is what the Lord is saying. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place whereupon thou standest is holy ground. Now, the first thing that would come to mind is what makes the ground holy? Because we see ground all the time. What made God the ground holy was the fact that God was there. The, the, now the ground is consecrated, it's hollowed, it's dedicated to the service of God at this time. So he tells him to take off his shoes. The, that, that means that he was letting Moses know, now you need to learn how to respect the true and living God. You had been raised in the court of Pharaoh where people may have bowed to you when they came into your presence, but now it's time for you to bow down to God. And his, that God was getting him ready. He said, the place that thou standest is, is holy ground. This, this ground is hallowed. This is, this is a special ground that you're standing on now because God is in this place. Verse six says, moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham. I'm the God of thy father. All of you call Abraham your father. All you of the Hebrew nation or the Israelite nation, y'all call Abraham your father. But I'm not just the God of your father, Abraham, but also I'm the God of Isaac, Abraham's son, that son that he took to the mountain to sacrifice when Abraham was told, take your son, your only son, and not, not saying that the other child was not his son, but the other son was a son of the flesh. This is the son of the spirit. This is the promised son, Isaac. He said, this is also, I'm the God of Isaac. But not only the God of Isaac, he said, I'm the God of Jacob, which would later be named Israel. I'm his God also. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Moses hid his face. He, he was afraid to look upon God is what the scripture tells, tells us here. He was in the presence of an almighty God. He, he was feeling what, what was going on at that time. He was seeing himself in a place where maybe I, I would die if I, if I looked upon the face of God as, as, as we saw in our last week's lesson. So he was afraid to look up at God at this time. He was a special, in a, in a special place. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. 
This man had now hid his face. He's in the presence of God. He's afraid. And the Lord begins to tell him about the people that he was most concerned about. More than likely, walking around in the wilderness for 40 years, he had had these people on his heart. And the Lord said, surely I've seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt. I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrow. The Lord began to say some, some things here. First of all, he said, I've seen it. The eye gate has taken attention. Now, I told Abram before he became Abraham that these things were going to happen. They were going to be in the uh, uh, stranger's land for 400 years. But, but now we see that God says that I see the affliction. I see exactly what they're going through at this time. I'm, I'm taking notice of it at this time. In other words, now that they, they have served that time that was already forementioned. And, and he said, I see the affliction of the people which are in Egypt, my people. He called them his people. And I've heard their cry. They are crying out. They want to be delivered is, is, is their, what, what they're saying. And, and, by reason of their taskmaster. The taskmasters were hard on them. If you know these, these accounts here, you know how they were uh, always having to bake bricks under the brutal sun and, 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 and drag them and put them up. And, and even getting straw was something that had become hard for them that they had to have to make bricks that was supplied by the Egyptians at one time, but because they wanted it to be harder on them, the taskmaster said, now you go and collect your own straw to even make the bricks. But not only that, but he said, for I know their sorrow. I know what's going on there. I know that they they are telling the people to kill all of the Hebrew boys, especially when you were there, Moses. He said, I know the, the sorrow, the, the, the things that, that the people are going through there in Egypt. He said, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. The Lord said, I've come down, came down through this man. God works through his people that he put here. This would be a prophet. God would speak through this prophet. He would, he would use this prophet in a, in a special way, but he, he says it here in a way that says, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good land, a large and unto a land flowing with milk and honey, a land that is fertile, that is good for living, that is productive, and that you will be able to, to satisfy your hunger with this land. The land will, will satisfy your families. You'll be able to build homes and establish yourself in this land is what God is saying here by saying it's a good land. And it's, a, it's a large land and it's flowing with milk and honey. Everything that's, that needs to be there to, to be your livelihood or take care of your life is represented there in the land. He said, and he gives a condensed list of, of the people that are there in the land at this time. He says, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Prezites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. He said, this land, this, this, is, this is the land that, that, that is going to be your land. You're going to have to drive those people out of that land, but it's a land that I've already given to you. I've already staked it out and said it's yours. And verse nine says, now therefore behold the cry of the children of Israel. It's come unto me. He repeats this. He said, now the cry, I've heard that cry again. He said that all, all, already in the seventh verse, it, it has come to me. And I've also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. The word oppress, there we go with that word again, to oppress, means to, in the Hebrew, means to crush. 
the same word as we say the lips is in the Greek, which means to crush. As we crush a, a grape to bring all the juices out of it. Well, they were getting all of everything out of this Hebrew nation that was there in the Egyptian nation. They were crushing them, oppressing them. They were oppressed. And God is saying that now I've heard their cry. I'm ready to go out and deliver my people. He said, come now. Therefore, and I will send thee to Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. He said, come on now, I'm, I'm going to send you. You're going to be the man to go in to Egypt and bring my people out of Egypt. He, he lets him know that this is going to be his task. I will send thee to Pharaoh. Now, we've seen the, the little movies and and we see the same Pharaoh is, is there after all of that time, but it wouldn't have been like that. The, the, in reality, when this man goes back, it's a different Pharaoh on the scene. Things, things are a lot different, and, and, and may, the Pharaoh is, is, is actually harder probably than the Pharaoh that was there when he actually left, left Egypt. But the Lord lets him know that I will send thee to Pharaoh that thou mayest bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And verse 11 says, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Forty years earlier, if the Lord would have called him, he said, boy, you picked the right man, God. But now God has this broken person, this person now that has learned to walk a different way, that has learned to pastor because the Psalms say that the amount of people that he would bring out of Egypt would be over 3 million people. He, he had to learn how to handle the flock how to deal with the flock in, in different ways. While he's out here in the desert, he ha he's receiving his greatest training, dealing with some, if he was dealing with sheep, some of the dumbest animals. Yet it was a thing of preparation, getting him ready for this particular task right here. But he said, who am I? At one time he might've said, I'm your man. But now he's saying, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? He, he realized that all of his self-confidence that he, he had once had was now all gone. His spirit was broken. But thank God in our weakness, he's made strong. He said that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Verse 12 says, and he said, certainly I will be with thee. This is what the Lord told him. This is what the Lord told the, the, let the judges know in our previous lessons. But this is what the Lord would be with his prophets also. He said, certainly I will be with thee. That's what makes all the difference in the world. If the Lord is with you, we are as believers now. We are the temple of the living God. And God is with us all the time and even right now. We don't, we, if we were to hide our faces at this time, that like there in verse six, if we were to crawl up under things, John there in, on the Isle of Patmos, when he realized he was in the presence of the Lord, he, he hid his face. He fell on his face, he said, as, as, a, as one that was dead. When Peter realized that he was in the presence of the Lord after he had brought in the great haul of fish, he said, Lord, depart from me for I am a sinful man. And it, it was Isaiah that said, I am a man of unclean lips and I live among people with unclean lips also. It, it, it's just certain ways when we are dealing with the Lord. That was the way Moses felt there in verse six. And now this is the way he's feeling in verse 12. As the Lord tells him, it's not you. He says, certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token. This, this is going to be a, a token unto you at this time. Uh, this is going to be something, uh, evidence, in other words, is what token means there. Uh, and that I have sent thee, when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. 
on Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, as we have studied already in this, this would be the evidence you'll serve at this mountain. Lord, we do thank you today for the study of your word. And Father, we pray that this word will get in our hearts and minds and simmer on us all day long. Father, we do pray that you will search our hearts, forgive us of sin. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.